Joey, can we go back to 1978 for a moment? Why? Well, I mean, you were on a show that I would watch every Saturday morning, which was American Bandstand. Okay, yes. And um, when did you find out and how did you find out that you were going to be interviewed by Dick Clark? Well, I had a, uh, I was on Millennium Records at that time, and the single had uh, just come out, and as that, as it was moving up the charts, I think one, in one week, I did like five TV shows. Donnie and Marie, American Bandstand, um, I, I did this thing called 36 Most Beautiful Girls in Texas, which was, I worked with all the te- uh, cowboy cheerleaders, and uh, the uh, Christy McNichol and the brothers, they had a show. So it was like a, in one week, I was like on all those shows. But uh, I always remember uh, the, uh, the American Bandstand because we had a rule in our family that you had to be a teenager to watch American Bandstand. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Did your mom see that interview? Uh, she did see that, yes. She did see it because uh, she had passed a little after that, but she did get to see all those shows. Yeah. Do you remember what it was like to go? I mean, because they had that the dancers in the audience there. Yeah, right? it was cool. I mean, well, I remember growing up with it as a kid and just to be there live. And uh, it, it, it was, uh, you know, it, it was fun, you know, to, to have your. But, you know, it's funny because all the TV spots that I did, I was more excited about being in a car on the way to the radio station and hearing the song over the radio. I don't know why that was more exciting to me than than being on television. Mm-hmm. I just like the idea of it being on radio. Why? I'm old school. WKRP in Cincinnati, great show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think you said in that interview with Dick Clark in 1978 that you had $50 in your pocket? I had $50 in my pocket. Oh God, I don't remember that. Okay, I think that's what it said. And so what was life I like? I had $50 in my pocket, uh, I said that? Sure, maybe or when at, the, at that moment, I don't know if like okay. really you did or metaphorically you had it oh, in your bank okay. account. Um, what, was like, what was life like for you before that interview and then mm-hmm. after, what was it like for you? Because all that exposure, I know you yeah. said you weren't as excited. I don't know. I, you know, it, it it was the same to me. It wasn't really that life didn't change that much. I didn't think because we were in and around show business, so it wasn't like I don't know. It just I I I lived the same way I do now as I did before uh, I had any exposure on television. So, where did you envision your life going at that time? Um, well, I, you know, I knew I was going to be doing TV, but when I got an offer to do the movie Sunnyside, uh, and I stepped foot on my first set, you know, my whole life changed then. That was the, what I love, and what I love, and that's how I learned filmmaking, from being on the set. And when I got to set, I was there every day because I was the star of the show. So I was in and around everything. And I wanted to know what the cameraman did. I wanted to know what the grip did, what the electrician. So as you know, it's hurry, hurry up and wait on these shoots and to be there and have a bird's eye view of what everybody did. But the thing that was the, the aha moment was that it became a family and Everybody worked together, all these people doing very, very different jobs, but all necessary to have that final outcome. That was like really cool to me. That's what got me interested in doing production and doing films, was that feeling on the set. And the education that took place. I was lucky because I was on set every day and I was getting paid, you know? And I had the time and I used that time to learn what everybody did. And every time I ever worked, I, I would do that. Because I was creating things and writing and stuff like that. But, you know, to hands-on nuts and bolts producing and stuff like that, that, that's where I learned all that stuff. When that production wrapped, 
how soon after did you say, you know what, maybe my life is going to take another direction. Maybe music won't be first and foremost. Uh, yeah, I was more into acting at that time, but at the same time, I was really interested in production. So once I started acting, you get the you know you get the bug to do that to do that more. But I always had my sights on production. I always liked the sense of everybody getting together and working together. I love that aspect of filmmaking. And did you like the being busy too? Some people aren't good I waiters. Have to be. That's why directing <laughs> is the best because you're involved with everything. So, you know, you 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 know they they come to you for guidance. So you're involved with everything. But I used to do all the prep and all the post too. And I all, I learned all that by doing, hence practical film workshops that that I'm doing today, teaching folks with developmental disabilities, filmmaking. That all came from that, you know, from from that. With inclusion films, right? Yeah. What did you learn from having a singing career that helped you navigate Hollywood career-wise? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that it, that, that I, I learned more with the filmmaking than I did with the singing, I think. Um, I, I think once I started in production, I learned quickly how the town works and all that. It took years. I mean, it, you know, a lot of knocking down doors and stuff like that and putting productions together. Uh, but I, I don't, I mean, I don't know how the singing influence, and I mean, it's business, so. Why? Was there the whole like payola with, uh, with the radio stations? I just remember, I'm going back to WKRP in Cincinnati, but just that whole pressure to get your song on the radio. Yeah, but you don't do that. The record companies do that. You have nothing to do with, you know, if, if that, I mean, they say that's the way things get added, but I was at the tail end of that. Casablanca Records was probably the last label that did big promotions. Uh, and... Um, I actually ended up on Sugar Hill Records was my last album, and that was a rap label right. from my hometown. The Sugar England. Hill Gang. Sugar Hill Gang. I was the only pop artist on, on that. You know, it was some years later, but wow. Um, yeah. You know. And then they had an A and R department, and all of that sort of went by the well, wayside. <laughs> I don't know about their A and R department. It was <laughs> okay. a little different. Okay. It was very different. What do you think stands in the way of most people achieving their goals? In, in the entertainment industry? Well, I mean, it's usually money, you know, because you need money to do production. Uh, the way I learned production, you learn to do stuff on a dime. You learn to, to, to beg, steer all, steal, borrow, beg, and steal. And when I say steal, I mean locations and shots and stuff like that. Um, you know, I mean, they, they, it's... It is it is money and finding the talent and doing all those things, but I I learn by doing. So um, I remember the first time I directed, uh, uh, I think it was Dumb Luck in Vegas, was it? And I was producing and starring in them, and the I I had no intention of going into directing, and the producer that was backing it said, hey. Uh, we want you to direct it. I said, but I don't really want to, you know, that's not what I'm looking to do. I said, why would you want me to direct? She said, because whenever there's a problem on a set, you diffuse it, you're able to, uh, you're able to work around whatever the problems are, and you make sure that everybody's a part of the process. And that's half the battle. You know, you know acting, I said, yeah, I do. I said, you know, writing, I do, you know and you're good with people, we think that you'd be a good director. And that's what, it, and then once I did it, it was like, then it, then it started from there, you know. I think you mentioned previously that your father taught you to include everybody, hence yes. inclusion film. Yeah. What did your mom teach you about acting? Um, well, I don't, you know, I think we were just in it and around it. She did drama classes in, in the basement. So we were just around it and my, sisters doing summer stock and my brother doing summer stock. I was the last one in, I because I was more interested in sports, you know, uh, in, in college and stuff like that. 
Uh, but uh, you're in it and around it, you, you know, almost like singing for your supper. Right. You know. And you're the oldest of six? Uh, no, I'm next to youngest. Oh. John, John is the baby. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm the next to youngest. Okay. All right. Well, we're all getting old, though. Had the order, had the birth order? Uh, Ellen, Sam, Margaret, Annie, Joey, Johnny. Right, okay. Yeah. Ellen is the oldest. Ah, okay. You had an English teacher, Mr. Bennett? Yes, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett, you said he was Southern gentleman, maybe I used the term yeah. loosely, with yeah. a, a bow tie. And you have a story, I think you were about 12? It was a penny waiting for change. And uh, he had said to the, uh, the uh, well, that's what his big thing was when he wanted to make you look stupid. He goes, so I'm going to make you look like a penny waiting for change. You know, I don't know what that is, but a penny waiting for change. And, and someone was asking a question. And uh, he had a New Jersey accent. And instead of asked, he said, asked. Hey, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? And Mr. Bennett said, you mean ask a question. You want to ask a question. And uh, he, made, he made the kid feel so little. And I remember saying to him, uh, hey, Mr. Bennett, can I ask you a question? Why are you such an ass or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, Mr. Travolta, I'm going to make you look like a penny waiting for change. And I just thought it was, it was a, a, a I used to defend a lot of the special needs kids in school growing up, so that's how I got into special ed, became a teacher. So I think if I remember the story correctly, you actually, you're, you're, you got in trouble or something, and then your father said, I like what you did in terms of sticking up for someone. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah he, he said there's a way to go about it, and you know, that it's, uh, you know, he says you just, you know, I, you're sticking up for your friend. and. And I, I, I'm, I have to recall my memory on this. And, and, uh, and then he said to me, uh, you know, he says, all right. He goes, now you know what to do next time. And then my dad said, can I ask you something? And I said, <laughs> you want to go out for pizza? It was cute. Do you think you've always been for the, quote, underdog? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All the time. So with inclusion films... Is part of you teaching how to do things on set there, but also part of not allowing others to try to knock somebody down a couple pegs? Well, I think it's, it, it's the process of making a film where the education takes place, whether you're going to be a filmmaker or not. It's not a really about filmmaking. It's about collaboration. It's about communication. Now, if you want to become a filmmaker, you know, we can help you do that. But it's all those soft skills that you learn through the process of making a film. And that came from the very first day I stepped on a set, as I said before. It's so important at becoming, because they're usually not included. They're not part of the process, whether it's in the play yard or being included, invited to parties or whatever. They're not usually a part of that. So filmmaking brings all that together. And it seems like they're very aware that they're not included. Like, I, I think I listened to one of your students at the same uh, mm -hmm. event where you talked about this story with your teacher, and he said, people talk, and they're always going to talk, something to that effect, and I've learned to kind of just deal with that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that's, yeah. that's really interesting, and, and because I'm, I'm sure they know when, you know, even if it's nonverbal, mm -hmm. someone doesn't like them or is giving them the cold shoulder. How, do you... Do you work with them on that? How to keep their morale up? Well, I, you know, I think it's just building that confidence as they go along, you know. And we do have some lower functioning folks that are in the program, but they get as much out of it as as the rest of the group. And one of the things that we're uh, so our higher functioning groups take care of the lower functioning groups because we want to eventually be able to do after school programs where our special needs students are going back to the high school that they went to or the school system and they're teaching from what they learned. You know, I mean, I always do that. I mean, half my staff is special needs up in Bakersfield. 
How do you know if an actor is present? How do you know if they're, I mean, you can tell when someone's in the moment. You, you, I mean, you can just, it's a feel. You, you, you know what it's like with this movie, Carol of the Bells. Um, and Andrea, who has Down syndrome, as you get older with Down syndrome, your memory starts to go. And so I had to feed her a lot of her lines. So you were never really able to do a big master shot because she would fumble, we'd have to feed or whatever. But then when you banged in for the coverage, I would be off screen getting it and I would know when I had that line. And you just know. I mean, it was so many moments that were just gold. And, you know, I knew I had it. You just know when you know. I, 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 and, uh, you know, she gave a beautiful performance. And a lot of people don't know what we needed to get to to get that. But she was right. As the character, she was right on. She was right. She had every emotional beat. And it was beautiful. Some of the scenes are just tearjerkers in the movie. When you see an actor is not present, what are some things you do to bring them back? Um, I, don't, I haven't really, I'm, most of my, the actors that I've worked with, see the thing is with, with, act, with casting, when you cast the right actors, you know, they're hired to do a job. You just create the most comfortable space for them to work in. Um, but you know, if it's not working, you you know, I, I don't like to give people line readings. I can, but I don't like to. I like them to give their interpretation of the character. So, uh, you know, you just keep going until you get it right. The nice thing now about not doing like film, you can have you have a lot more flexibility, you know, because when you had to go back to film and and develop it and transfer it and do all that now with the digital format. It makes it a lot easier. How do you like to direct actors from having been an actor yourself and have seen what works and what doesn't, how an actor corrects I someone? let them go. I let them go. It, again, back to casting. You know, and you, you know, if something's not working, I'll, I'll stop it. But, you know, when you're hiring that actor, you know they're going to deliver the performance that you want them to. You know, just there may be technical things that go, but usually when you hire that actor, you want them to bring what they have to the table, unless they're way off base. Which happens. It happens, yeah. So if you see someone, maybe they're not even way off base, but there's something that's not working, how do you approach them? It's different in each scenario, it depends on. Can you give me some examples? You know, it, it's really dialing back, or it really depends on it, I, I, I can't give you a specific one, but I, I, you know it when it happens. So let's say I'm an actor, and yeah. for whatever reason, Karen, which wouldn't be unusual, is off today. <laughs> yeah. And so. Well, I would take them aside. What's going on? What do you? Okay. You know, what do you? Uh, I, I, I'm not going to mention names, but I had uh, uh, one of our cast members that was not feeling like there. there was, she was working with a bunch of stars, and she was intimidated by them. And I took her aside and I said, I said, I gotta tell you, you're knocking this out of the ballpark. You've got this. You don't feel that you're not as good. I said, you're right in there. Your, your performance is spectacular. Just keep going and do what you do. You've got this, you know. And the whole, it changed. Changed, right. Yeah. So, so knowing that you have the actor's back, so to speak, and yeah, not, you're, you're not scolding. You, got, you know what it, it is? It's like Love Boat. You know, love boat. Oh yeah, I know. Captain wow. Stubing. Yes. <laughs> I'm Captain Stubing. I'm the host of the love boat, is what it is. Okay. And I have the hair of Captain <laughs> Stubing now too. No, but it's really making people feel comfortable to perform because they're professional actors. You hire them for a reason because you know they can do the job. So now my job is to make sure it all works and flows together, but. You know, you're, you're giving them the canvas to, uh, you know, to paint on. And, sure. and, and hopefully they, you know, I, I, it's, you know, it's, you, you, you're, you're a host. But you got to make everybody on the set feel that way. Craft service, PAs, editors, cinematographers, stars, 
they're all treated the same. Everybody is treated the same, like shit. No, I'm kidding. And when you watched your dad include people, mm -hmm. you know, especially we're in LA, it's very hierarchical. Well, That's we grew up word. in Jersey, so. Right, I understand. I, yeah. I'm, I'm aware of the East Coast uh, yeah. uh, background as well. And I know there is a difference in, in, in approach, but still, some people want to include people, but and they and they and they speak that, but they don't. Mm -hmm. How did you watch your dad in action? Treat treat people to make everybody feel like they were on a level playing field. He just did it. I mean, he was just he was just a kind kind man. I mean, everybody was treated with respect, and that's what he always taught me. He says you got to treat people with respect. And they'll treat you with respect, hopefully. But even if they don't, you still treat people kind. Kindness is the most important thing. You know, there's a, that, it's gone now. There's not as much kindness as, there. I mean, just people aren't being kind to each other. But he was always kind. He led by example. And you, I saw him. And the, you know, you go to church and, you know, he says, you know, so many people, will they, he kind of talked like this. He goes, they, they, they want to sit right in the front of the church like they're going to be closer to God. And then in the vestibule, they're talking about how they screw people in business. He goes, I don't like that. And, you know, and I'm hearing this at nine years old. And I go, I get it. You know, I get it. That's, you know, so he, he just, you know, he, he, he was fair. Yeah, I like that when you say that even if the other person doesn't return the respect. No, it's, you're not looking for a return. You're not looking for a return. You do things because it's the right thing to do. And if you expect things back, I, I never expect anything back. You say you learned filmmaking from the other side of the camera? Yes. Well, as an actor. And I said the first day on the set, I wanted to know what everybody did. Right. And so whenever I got the opportunity to act in films, it was almost like studying. And then when I got to make my first film, you know, uh, I'll give you an example. The uh, uh, movie was called, uh, it was called uh, Vegas Vice, uh, but they changed the title, Hard Vice, I think it was. So now this was my first one on my own, producing and directing. And we had a really nice script, and we're in Vegas. We have a 12-day shoot, which is not a lot of days. And we are going like, oh my God, Everything's going, everything is perfect, you know, no problems. You know, we shot, we got, we finished on time, on budget. We got an advance from a distributor. So we start editing. And I get the cut. And it was really, really good. But it was only 62 minutes. And I had to deliver 90 minutes. So now I got to come up with you know, with another 30 minutes. You know, you can't, you can't run end credits for a half hour. <laughs> if I could, I would have. No, but, but so now I had to come up with, you know, the money to do it. How are we going to do this? Where are we going to do it? And we literally, I took a weekend and shot at my house, at my brother-in-law's house, at the bar downtown. We had to get all those locations and everything for free. And we ended up, you know, finishing and delivering and, you know, but that was the biggest education that I ever had because it's usually a minute a page, but if your print's a little bigger and becomes three quarters, you know, uh, and it's more like, you know, 45 seconds a page, that makes a big difference in the end, in the end uh, product. So uh, I learned that the hard way, you know. And this was in Englewood, New Jersey? No, no, this we were in California by then. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, this is one of my first directing and producing on my own, where I put the money together, got in the van from a distributor, and we, you know, we piecemealed it together. But, uh, you know, we didn't find out till later. But you do, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, it was called Da Vinci's War. We needed a church, and no church would let us uh, uh, do the movie. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, and we needed a bell tower. And I went to the church and they wouldn't give us the church and 
I couldn't find the church that had a bell. We built the bell tower. And basically what happens is my niece is abducted by a priest that's a part of the CIA, whatever, and they're in the bell tower, and I have to go up. We built a bell tower that the scene was taking place in, but I needed to come up to the church, and then I needed to hear her scream and go around. So I said, you know what? We're gonna steal this. Three o'clock in the morning, and it was Easter uh, Saturday, okay? So I brought a small crew, and I was the star of it. So I said, all right, because this is what we're going to do. We go, I run up. Uh, uh, I'll go the, uh, to uh, grab the handles, and blood will be on it. So we need so one shot running up, the insert of the blood on the hand, my reaction to the scream, and me coming out and running. Five shots, and we got it, right? So... Three o'clock in the morning, we run there, get the camera set up, put the blood on the doors, do the whole scene, run it, boom, we're out of there like in, in like a 45 minutes to an hour. So I get back that night and I'm laying in bed and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna be punished, I'm gonna go to hell for this. And then all of a sudden I remembered, we didn't wipe the blood, we didn't wipe the blood off the handles. So now everybody's coming on Easter Sunday thinking it's some kind of stigmata. <laughs> so I said, oh, God's going to get me on that one. But sometimes you got to do what you got to do. You've worked with a diverse group of people. Yes. Diverse group of kids. Yeah, my first job was at, at an orphanage okay. for children. Yeah. What does each group need that the other doesn't? So you're working with kids from an orphanage versus kids that maybe... Um, came, grew up in a middle class home, mm -hmm. expected to go to college, maybe they didn't. What does each group need when you teach them about filmmaking? Well, I, that when I was uh, uh, in the orphanage teaching, I wasn't doing filmmaking. I, I was just a special ed teacher. I didn't do filmmaking until later. So when I taught, the way I taught was very, very different. I, I taught performance. It was almost like performance art. My theory was that if, if kids can watch TV for five hours and not get bored, if I could make my lesson plan that interesting, you know, I would get to them. But it's a lot of work, you know, because you got to script every night and do the whole thing. But I got their attention and it, and it was working. My problem when I was an early teacher, I was putting all my money back into the kids. I would have gone broke. So I stopped teaching after a couple of years and did what everybody does when they stop teaching, go into show business. Well, I think you, your father wanted you to get a degree, and so... Yeah, my dad wanted me to, I promised my dad I would get a degree, and the, te and the jobs that were open were special ed, and I was always, you know, kind of the protector of special needs kids, so it, it made sense, you know, to go into that, you know. Um, but now dealing with the group that we... It's really, um, what was the question again? So when you work from kids, when you work with kids from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. so let's say you're working with kids that were in an orphanage, whether you're teaching them filmmaking or not, mm -hmm. versus kids that maybe had a more quote unquote middle class upbringing, two parents who wanted them to go to college, whatever, what are their needs in the class? Well, I think it's, it's what everybody needs that you want them to buy into what you're doing. You know, when you feel like you're a part of something, because you don't ever know what, what you know, the filmmaking stuff, it's a tough business. It's not an easy business. But that's why I say with uh, the special needs kids that we do, they get so much more out of it because of the involvement and being part of a group. So you want to make sure that they feel a part of it. And then, you know, where they go from that, whether it's going to be editing or camera or whatever, that's going to be, that's their journey. But I think the most important thing is making them feel like they're a part of the team. You did a documentary or you were part of a young man's documentary, uh, Normal People yeah. Scare Me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that. I, I can identify with that. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, when you sat the children down or some were teenagers, I believe, and you did the interviews with them, what was important for you? 
in that moment? Well, the, the, so let me back up on that. how that got started was my daughter, I was running a thing called Entertainment Experience where we were teaching neurotypical children. And my daughter, Rachel, started a film festival at Chaminade High School and said, Daddy, can you help me out? I said, what do you need? And she says, well, I've never done a film festival before. I said, all right. I said, I'll give you things, give you things to give away, uh, like you know, classes or camps or whatever, so you have prizes, and then I'll get you some PR. And I did this article in this newspaper called The Acorn. And in the article, I, it mentioned that I was a former special ed teacher and also talked about this concept of a practical film workshop. So two parents with children with, uh, uh, on the spectrum came to me and asked if I would open the doors to special needs kids. I said, absolutely. You know, I said, I have the teachers here, I have the space. And the other one said, well, my son would like to submit a film. I said, okay, what's the film about? Uh, it's about uh, what it's like to be autistic from an autistic kid's point of view. I said, that's cool. I said, send me the film. So he didn't know how to make a film. So I said, well, let me meet him. And I met him and after meeting him, I said, all right, I'm gonna give you a cameraman and an editor and I'll mentor you through this process. And that started, it was like a 10 minute documentary. And uh, I got, uh, I pitched it to the Daily News and they did a big story about it. And then ABC News came down and uh, uh, PBS did a documentary about the making of this little film festival that we're expecting 50 people, 500 showed up. People from, from uh, Ireland and Italy came and they wanted to know about this kid. But I said, you have to do the work. I'll provide the cameraman and the editor. You have to do the interviews. You have to do all the questions. And that's what happened. And then I mentored him and then later we did a feature length documentary uh, later. But you know, it was important that he did the work. And when you did the feature length documentary or even with the short, were you there during any of the interviews? Yeah, I was there through most everything. Except there was a couple on location I wasn't at. Oh, okay. And I sent my camera guy to do it, so. And how did you make the people feel relaxed? How did I make them feel relaxed? Oh, God. I, 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 I don't, I, I just, I just do it. I just go. I mean, when we do these camps, I have 50 kids on the spectrum that don't know each other. And I come in, quiet on the set. This is what we're going to do. The train's leaving the uh, station. Jump on board. Nobody questions it. They just, you know, it's like when I think about what we do in less than 50 hours with 50 kids that don't know each other, and get on board, they buy into it right away. And all the times that we've done camps, and I'm doing them 13 years now, so thousands of kids, we've only had to ask uh, two to leave because everybody bought into it. And it, it's really something to see that whole process. That's like really cool. Sorry, neurotypical? Neurotypical, like, like Tina, she's neurotypical. No, well, you know, they say normal, but what is normal? Don't yeah. know. Yeah, neurodiverse now is the new uh, uh, phrase now for people with disabilities. Neurodiverse. And, and does that mean on the spectrum? Do they no longer? Well, neurodiverse spectrum? means they could be, you know, it could be autism, it could be Down syndrome, it could be whatever. They're different. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. I don't know. Everybody's the same to me. So. What makes the Travoltas such great storytellers? The Travolta is such a story. No, I don't think. Well, we've been in it and around it. I mean, they, I, I, uh, I don't know. I just always like telling stories. From a very young age, I like telling stories. Um, I, it's the listening and watching. I observe. All my siblings are like that. But I like to observe people. I'll go you know, walk around the mall just to look at people and always, I always wonder where they came from, what do they do, you know, 
what would what is it like at their house at Christmas time? What is it, you know, what's a birthday party like? And you know, what do these people do? It's I like I like people. I re- I love people, and I think that's a, a big part of it. And uh, uh, I'm very comfortable going into a room of perfect strangers and taking the room over. You know, I, if I had to, not that I want want to do that, but I'm just saying I'm comfortable like that. My sister Ellen's like that. We enjoy mingling and meeting people and doing that, um, and we're very comfortable with that, my sister Ellen and myself. Do you collect people? Uh, yeah, I have two in my trunk right oh, now. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> you want... Two yeah. I collect people. No, no, not like that, but you know, no. there's some people they do, they collect people. They have them as an extension of their own family? Yeah, it's they all work for me. <laughs> okay. I have the same staff for like 10 years now, 12 years, and that's that's a sign of, you know, when you have the same people working for you, they either they like you or, you know, I mean, it's, we have a lot of fun at what we do, you know. If, if I didn't have fun with what I'm doing, I wouldn't do it. And by me having fun doing it, we make it fun for everybody else. But collecting people, well, no, I don't collect people. I like people, no. When you look at a script, whether you plan to produce or direct it, how are you analyzing it to see if this is a project you want to be a part of? Uh... Well, with Carol the Bells, most of the, I mean, I've developed a lot of the scripts that we'd end up making. Because I had development deals with several studios, but they never got made. That's why I went independent with them, putting them together. And some of them have certain elements attached to it, and maybe some cash or whatever. But uh, like for Carol the Bells, I was in Bentonville at the Bentonville Film Festival. And we always make short films at the studios so up until the time that i was i i was doing like two features a year and then when i started doing the programs i did a couple of documentaries but i hadn't done a feature in a while but at the workshops throughout california we teach camera we teach lighting set building anything that goes into filmmaking we teach we develop a short film and that film becomes the lesson plan for that semester so we're constantly making content. So I looked at the overall picture. We have six studios that have pros working there. And all these students that we've trained, I said, why don't we do a feature? It's time to do a feature. And at the film festival, I had run into a, a woman named Gail Williamson who is an agent for folks that are neurodiverse. And we were on the same panel and I said, hey, I said, do you, do you have any scripts? I'm looking for something that features somebody with a disability that's simple to do. Small cast, simple locations. And that's when I read Carol of the Bells and it met that criteria. I'm looking to do, you know, cause like in Bakersfield, the community works with us. so locations you can get for free. Uh, They just open their doors to you there. Uh, So you're getting really good production value. We made a great deal with the hotels and the the way we did it was each facility, uh, like Bakersfield is mine, I own, and the other ones are like franchises. So they sent two pros down and two students and then we used all our students that were ready to work to make this. And uh, so the criteria for that was limited locations, getting as much production value as you can with no money. And again, it's borrowing, stealing, whatever, but it's going in and, you know, going into someone's house and saying, hey, you know, we'd love to shoot here. We don't have any money. Would you let us use your house? And finding some beautiful locations and people working with you. So. It's a good way to learn filmmaking, you know, to do without when you produce something. Because then later when you have money, it's like, oh. I remember the first time I directed a union shoot. It was um, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And all of a sudden I had a staff of like 75 people. 
in a production meeting and we're talking about, okay, we'll do this and we'll do that. And it was when I just joined the DGA, I had to because I was directing an episode. Uh, John Landis was producing the show at the time. He was a friend of mine. And uh, so we're at the meeting and, uh, and we're talking about, uh, oh, we were talking about, there was a scene where uh, they were putting a dog on trial. And I said, okay, I said, you know what would be really cool is when that dog is sworn in, if he had a jury of his peers <laughs> and have all dogs, <laughs> and they said, we love that, okay, great, like that. So we got all dogs, and it was a really cute scene. And then they were talking about, you know, they'd like to get uh, someone in a special outfit for it. And I was like, well, you know, I said, there's a mall right over by my hotel. I can go and get that, you know, after. And they said, uh, you don't need to do that. You know, you don't, need, you don't need to do anything. We have people that do all that. Because you can't, on a set, you can't touch anything when it's a union shoot. If you're uh, the light, lighting people, touch the lighting. Grip, touch grip, you know, and I'm used to like, you know, really being involved. And if we needed to move a light, you move a light, you know. Uh, so it was it was a little tough getting used to having that many people working with you. But I did get my jury of the peers, and it was really very cute. When you looked at scripts previously to Carol of the Bells, what were you looking for? I mean, it, it, is it something that well, a lot of them we created? You know, oh. we we developed ourselves, so we were just looking for good stories. You like wrote Mel, them. we create. Well, if not, I was involved with the creation, like the movie Mel. Navajo Blues, uh, uh, Detour. These are all scripts that we, were, Da Vinci's War, these are all scripts that we developed in-house. So you just look for a, a, a really good story. Um, and I have a couple of scripts I want to eventually do, but you know, I, I, I'm a little busy right now. So it's, I spend all my time at, you know, doing camps and traveling around. But I, I want to do one more. And I don't know what that's going to be yet. So, knowing that you were a teacher, I don't know if you had your teaching credential or yes. okay. When do you think an artist should leave their day job? Suppose an artist has something. When to fall do they back leave on. their debt? When they can afford to, you know, when they can afford to do it. I guess I don't know. I never really had a day job. I don't think I ever had a well the tire shop if you consider that. Where was this? In New Travolta Tire Exchange in New Jersey. Oh, that was your dad's I, I was, shop? I was changing tires up until I had a record on the charts. Wow. I got a call, and uh, and it was uh, Jimmy Einer, and, uh, and the guy said, hey, uh, your record is like 50 with a bullet. And I was like, well, tell him I'll call him back. i got to finish balancing <laughs> these tires. So... And so you're, you're working on that car. What's going through your head at that moment? Well, it was pretty exciting, you know, to have a charting record. That's what, you, that's what you hope for when you're an artist. But I was still working at the tire shop. So. And when did you finally say, listen, I don't think I'll be putting in as many hours here? Uh, when I moved out to California, I, I was still, I mean, I was still putting in to help out my dad and stuff like that, so... Did you I drive out? Excuse me? Sorry, did you drive out? Did you drive uh, or you no, flew? No, no. we flew out, and I remember we would, I uh, was stopping uh, in, I had a development deal with Paramount. We stopped in Vegas to do the Jerry Lewis telethon. And then we moved right uh, there, and then I started Sunnyside shortly after that. So, Where was your first apartment? Uh, in um, it was in uh, Westwood, and we got robbed, so we moved to Beverly Hills, and we got robbed again, <laughs> so we moved further into Beverly Hills. Yeah, it was like crazy. It was great. We got robbed like twice. Was there like a rash of like burglaries or what? What, in, really in no, West just that, you know, they, one they broke through the window, the other, oh my God, they, um, my father-in-law, who was a comedian, Dick Sean, 
And he was in movies like The Producers and It's a Mad, Mad World. And he used to get us gifts. And it was just when those duffel bags came, uh, they were becoming popular. And on this trip, he gave us three huge duffel bags that were stuffed with Chinese newspaper. And he says, you got, he goes, this is unbelievable. He goes, you, got, you do a lot of traveling, you're gonna need this. He goes, you would be surprised what you can get in these bags. So the next day, um, I got a, um, um, Wendy and I had just gotten married and uh, I think it was at the racetrack or something, I got a call and they said, uh, uh, Mr. Travolta, you, you know, your wife just called, your house was robbed. And I'm going, oh man. So this is Beverly Hills now. They literally took the front door in midday off the hinges and we had a golden, we still have golden retrievers. We had a golden retriever that was sitting in the middle of the living room with Chinese newspapers all around him. They used the duffel bags <laughs> to rob us. So when he said, you'd be surprised what you can get in these bags, they took everything, but if they had gone another room over, my wife's diamond ring was in there and cash and a camera and all that. But the golden retriever was just pointing out the most expensive things, and and uh, so, and then we uh, we moved further into Beverly Hills. So. But they left the dog alone. The dog was just sitting there. He was, like I said, he was probably pointed to things. Now yeah, yeah, that over there. So, did you want to go back to New Jersey when that happened? No, yeah. no, I was okay. Okay, I was okay. What's your formula for telling a good story? You say you love telling stories. You love to see the. The look in people's eyes, micro expressions. Um, well, you want to be able to tell a good story, you know, and you want to have a beginning and middle and end on them, you know. So, uh, I don't know, it's just, uh, yeah, it usually comes off of somebody, like someone will say something about this, and I'll have a, I usually have a story that will complement other stories. And you never know what that is until, you know, until you hear somebody else speaking, and then you'll tell a story about what happened to you when, when you were a kid, or you know, whatever, and you just start building them up, I guess. When you say you kind of can command a room. Yeah. People kind of flock to you, and. Well, no. I, what I'm saying is I'm comfortable, you know, going around and introducing myself, and what what, what I mean, I, you know, take what I mean by take over a room that. If it's an event like, you know, Carol the Bells when we had the screening, I'm very comfortable. It's like being at a wedding, you know, when you're the when your daughter's getting married and you got to go greet everybody. I'm very comfortable with doing that, and and the same as, you know, at a party or something like that, for uh, you know, for business purposes and stuff like that. You know, uh, like I said, a screening of Carol the Bells to meet the people that come down and support you and you know, make them feel like they're a part of the whole thing. It's being a host, it's Captain Stubing. Right, and to being a director is being a good host? I think so. Well, so in telling a good story though, you have to keep it interesting and if you can yeah. just see someone's attention is waning, how do you bring them back? I don't have to bring them back. <laughs> wow, okay. Are you a Leo, if I'm by Lucy, the way? No, no I'm, I'm a Libra. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, so the scales. No, okay. if you, yeah, if it's not working, you know, you, you know. ditch it. You know, okay. You ditch the story. All right. Yeah. You but sure. you try to know, but it's looking, the most important thing is looking in people's eyes and, and get it, making that connection when you're telling them. Like if I'm telling a story and then someone comes in and interrupts it in the middle, it drives me fucking crazy. I don't, I, I don't, li I don't like losing... Like if I'm going to tell a story, I want whoever I'm telling the story to be into it and making that contact and telling that story. You know, and if you can't command the attention, because that's what it is, it's, you know, you, you, you know, you're, you, it's your audience. You want to entertain. You want, I mean, people tell stories because they want to entertain or there's a commonality, you know. And so you learned about being an entertainer very young. Did you have to, around the dinner table, were you and your siblings trying to outdo one another 
at supper time or no? No, I think it was more compliment. We enjoyed each other's company. You know, we enjoyed each other's company. I mean, when I was very young, I knew how to make people laugh. And, and uh, I, you know, that's like, in fact, when you, when you know you can make someone laugh, you know, that's a very strong, that's a strong tool. When you work with the kids uh, for inclusion Great films, sense of humor. Great, that's what I was wondering, yeah. They can. You have to see the interviews that I do with the kids. I saw some of the, I don't know if it was behind the scenes for Normal People Scare Me or was no, the actual no, that's trailer? Not, no, I'm not talking about, oh, I'm talking okay. about the camps that we do. The camps, okay. And I interview 50 of the kids, each camp, and eight different questions and asking them, you know, life questions. Like Nobody what? ever talks to these kids that way. I'm asking advice from them. Like what? On what well, my daughter's getting married, okay? Uh, this is back when she was getting married. Oh, I see, okay. And uh, we just bought the wedding dress and we got the venue. I said, it's beautiful, we're really, really excited. I said, but um, I don't like the guy she's marrying, what do I do? <laughs> and then they start giving me advice about, well, you know, in movies, you can take them out into the park. When not looking, you can shoot them, you know, stuff like that. Or, you know, and I, and I just said, nobody ever asked me why I don't like him. And it was like, okay, well, why don't you like him? I said, well, number one, he's really good looking. Well, that's not bad. I said, number, <laughs> number two, he's the nicest guy in the whole world. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. I said, and he treats her like gold. He goes, well, there's nothing wrong with that. And I said, and he's got a lot of hair. Then what could be wrong with yeah, that? He's goes, too perfect. And you don't. He said, you know, or my favorite one was, uh, uh, they said, I understand now. He goes, you're kind of in the same boat that my dad's in. And I said, okay, what boat is that? He said, the hair cul-de-sac. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm there. Where? where <laughs> the hair cold the sack. Ah, I okay. said. Oh, I said cold the sack. <laughs> it took really? me a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, so I mean, just just stuff all the time. I mean, just. Right. I enjoy that. That's my favorite part of the camp is doing the interviews, and then they have to pitch me their stories. I have to prove them. So. What type of stories? Whatever they come up with. In terms of a story of a film they want to make. Well, the film they want to make, you know. We'll have different themes. It'll be like, uh, you can't judge a book by its cover. Uh, this year we want to do films on social impact. It's always something, and then they make the films and they make the PSAs and between the interviews and the behind the scenes and the pitches, you have a half hour documentary and then a vehicle to show uh, the films, so. You said 11 years you've been doing this with uh, Since film? 2006, so. Okay, how have you seen the evolution of young people. I know right now they have these climate activists, which I think are great. Maybe some parents don't think that's great. Mm -hmm. I'm not a parent, but I think it's great that people are more cause driven now. It seems like Generation X, yeah. my generation, we weren't that cause driven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but baby boomers were, you know, you, yeah. each one has its own sort of thing that they're after, whether it's leisure or fighting for a cause. Mm -hmm. What do you see with the young people that are coming into the camps now? Well, I, it's just so so video games and and all the uh, uh, all the devices now. If uh, we we don't let them have their devices when they're at the camp, they got to focus in on what they're doing. I don't know that that's a good thing. Um, I, I don't know. I, I it doesn't change that much, really. No. No. Do you think that they're so into the devices because that's their world that they can control? Well, it is. I mean, look at, I mean, you would go out to a restaurant, everybody's on their phone. It's just, I find myself doing it. I try not to, but, you know, when you think about how much you use the device, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a great thing. Sure, no, I get it. We can be ruled by our technology, but... I'm talking about kids. I mean, you haven't stopped playing that video game you're playing right Yeah, now. I know. And by the way, oh, hang on. Somebody's texting me real quick. Um, no, I think that that in, in the sense of um, if somebody doesn't feel a part of the world, they don't feel included. They're going yeah. right. to find so an attachment to something. That's what's That's what's important about the camps and the workshops is they are included. And we make them a part of something bigger than that.
you know, an outcome. The outcome is the film you do or being a part and you share that with your families. You know, and you make a film, that's forever. What's the biggest setback you've faced in your career? I tend not to dwell on those type of things. So, uh, you know, uh, we just try to keep going with whatever we do. But, I, um, you know, I mean, there's been movies that we had tried to put together and they didn't, you know, they didn't come through or whatever. You know, those are minor setbacks. But you know, I think as long as you have your health, you know, uh, 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 that's the most important thing. Um, I don't, I don't think there's any that I really major setbacks. Nothing, just no. smooth sailing. Well, not smooth sailing. You just, I don't, I don't, I can't think of something that was like that. I lost a lot of sleep over. Right. So is that where the inclusion films comes in because? If if a script doesn't turn out, a product money falls through. It, you know what? It's just when we when we're in film camp, when, you know, with my teachers, because as I told you, the process the mo most important thing. What they get out of those relationships and having a friend, because some of these kids have never had friends before. So to become a part of something, that's the most important thing. And when you're making something in two weeks, three short films. You know, I said, guys, don't worry. The film doesn't have to be perfect. What has to be perfect is these guys get the experience of what it's like to work together and come up with something. That's more important than anything. You know, you know, there's not a lot you can do in a day and a half because that's how long they have to make their short film. I said, so it's got to be fun. It's got to be, you, you got to teach as you go. That's the most important thing. Uh, but you know we've we've had some cute films over the over the summers, you know. Uh, but again, it's the process. And when it's a wrap for for everyone, uh -huh. a lot of people, unless the production went horribly, it is like their family, and it is it is a little sad. Or you're, yeah, you're but it's like the last day of school, high school. Oh, that you know, yeah. But you know, <laughs> you're going out. The difference is, most of you like. I find like when you do like a three or four week shoot, come that fourth week, everybody's looking, okay, well, what am I gonna do next? That's the problem with filmmaking, unless you're in a series, is that you're an independent contractor and your next job is really, really important. And it has that feel to the last week of school when you're in high school sometimes, when you do these. But you know, as a director, you continue on. So you continue the process. And I love the process. I really do love the process. And even the post process I love. Because I did all the post on all, I, I learned the hard way with, uh, uh, we did, you know, when we were doing this film, it was right when the Avid first came out. And so on the Avid, you can make it dissolve, you can do a fade to black, you can do all these effects. So now you're doing this film and you have slow fades and you have this and you have that. What I found out the hard way was in order to do those effects, you gotta pay for those effects because you gotta go back to film, you gotta go back to lab. And our budget was like 300,000. And when the guy who was directing, I got the cut list and I sent it off to the effects house. And there was a bill for like 350,000. And I said, all right, how many of these effects that we can do within the budget? And instead of like 80, it was like, we can do 15, and that's it. So I had to go back, you need to recut it, which was easy to undo. I said, but this is what you have, and you gotta make that work. But you know, I found out the hard way. I didn't know, I learned by doing. And for the kids, when it's the end of the shoot, when it's the end of camp, Mm -hmm. Knowing that some of them, this may have been the first time that they actually had friends or mm -hmm. been included. What's that like? Well, they know there's going to be, everyone has a red carpet screening. So they know in a couple months they'll have, and some of them are like big deals. Limousines. The kids get dressed up in tuxedos and gowns and do the whole thing. 
and they share that with their family. So they, you know, with us as teachers going, you know, it's always sad when you go, you know, when you're finishing up, you got to say goodbye to all the kids. But the great thing is we're going to the next city and we're going to do it over again with a whole different total group. And that's like the fun that keeps you going. Then the last camp, you're ready to go home. So, but uh, for the kids, you know, they have their screenings and they do make their friends and, you know, so it's cool. But the, the big thing is the red carpets after. Do you plan on retiring ever? Not right now. No, I'm, you know, I, I'm 69 now. So as long as I feel good, yeah. as long as I feel good, I mean, I love what I do, you know, and if you love what you do, it's not, you know, it's not like work. So as long as, you know, about I, I got a grandchild coming in, huh? in, uh, in uh, June. So, a new grip. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> you know, that's going to change a few things, you know, because I want to spend a lot of time. But luckily, when the baby's born, we have three camps up in the Bay Area. So I'll be able to you know, to be there for it. She lives up in San Francisco, my daughter. And if the grandchild wants to be a filmmaker, what yeah. happens? What happens? Bring them to the camps. Well, They're going to start working. Yeah, <laughs> I, they, they can use my wheelchair as a dolly. <laughs> I don't think that will be happening for a long time. But. Well, thank you. Yeah.